In August of 1971, the Cary Trust offered the New York Botanical Garden a gift of land. On this land, in Millbrook, New York, the Cary Arboretum was established. The Arboretum was a dream, a dream that we'd long held. We needed a place to test trees and shrubs and woody plants to carry out the kinds of studies that required time and space and protection from the intrusion of urban pressures. Perhaps most of all, it's the gift of this land in all its diversity and beauty that makes it possible for us to carry out the kind of work that we are doing here. Well, the area for the tender conifers first, I would think would quite obviously be in the valley here. You see how it's protected yeah. on the west and the north, but then you see you get up on top of the ridge and the backdrop would well, be... I'm horticulturist at the Arboretum. And the thing that fascinates me is this idea of a brand new Arboretum starting from scratch that's going to have a major collection of plant materials the opportunity to be a part of that and to um, assist in building the collection and to acquire plants for the collection. These are plants that will be here long after I'm gone and they'll be useful to people long after all of us who are here now are gone and they'll be plants that scientists in the future will be using as part of their research programs. Well, are these the cuttings from last February over here? Yeah, some of them uh, have been in the mist all along. Other ones have been in the tent. And most of the ones in the mist have rooted. Some of them in the tent have not. And we've just put them under the mist now. And we're hoping that they'll take... We're trying to build a collection of trees and shrubs, which will include basically every tree and shrub that will prove to be hardy in our climate. These come from all over the world. Some of them may turn out to be uh, very ornamental. Others may prove adaptable to use in urban situations in cities. Many of the plants that we're growing have never been grown in this area before, so it's very experimental. to set aside approximately 100 acres of the Arboretum land where we will concentrate some of the plant materials that will be of the most interest to the general public and also to be able to have demonstrations of um, plant materials that will be used in our educational program.
here. How many of you like snakes? Me. Me. Everybody Mom. likes snakes. Okay. Some people call you gardener snakes because you find them in the garden a lot. Others call them garter snakes because they have stripes on them like sort of like garters, I guess. I don't know. But that's what they call them, garter snakes. Wait, isn't it funny? Hold it, let him go. Hold him in one hand for a minute. Wait, I Hold can't him in get one hand for a minute. Isn't it funny how he just sticks out? Why does, like he, that. why does he flick out his tongue? I know how to handle no. snakes. To smell. He smells with his tongue. The tongue <laughs> picks up too. odors that are in the air. Doesn't it look funny how he goes out straight? Yeah, don't, don't squeeze him. The children's nature program. That was very successful. That was fun, too. The response was very good. They got a taste of what things are like outside, and then they were able, after the uh, initial walk, to bring some of these things back and do things with them and I think created in them a whole new feeling for what is out there. I know how they... Right on through. It's like a little nip. He's getting nervous. I know, a lot of people faster. think they're slimy and... Are they slimy? No! Careful, don't squeeze. You want one? Let him go. Let him come down this way. Here comes Dan. Here comes Dan. Here comes Dan. My work in forest pathology involves principally the study of wood decay fungi and the physiology of how they decay wood. And I use the arboretum to collect wood decay fungi for use in the laboratory and then use these fungi in a process that may be very practical and serve in this way to bring about changes that may diminish pollution, for instance. There needs to be more field work done in science, I think. Most of the work has been done in the laboratory with controlled experiments, and this is all well and good. But at the same time, one must have an appreciation for what nature is and try to understand what nature is so that we can better able to live with it. American elm, as you know, is being wiped out by the Dutch elm disease. I've been working on urban tree problems related to forest genetics. And what we're trying to do is to develop a technique whereby we can hybridize American elm with the Asian elm species, which have good resistance to Dutch elm disease. The uh, second project is doing some cytological work on uh, urban trees. We're trying some new staining techniques which have not been used on hardwood tree chromosomes. And it's an area that really has been very little studied in terms of man hours by tree cytogeneticists. primary interest is working with living plants in their natural environment or natural habitat. Research involving insect-plant relationships with ants and plants or butterflies and bees. The example of ants and peonies demonstrates how a species of plant and ants co-evolved for the mutual benefit of each other. The plant supplies food to the ant and the ant in turn provides protection to the plant through defending that food source. 
the importance of an understanding and awareness of ecological relationships is paramount because we as humans are totally dependent upon them for our survival and for the stability of the natural world. This is burdock. In this stage right now, it's edible. In fact, I've been told by a girl who works at the Arboretum, who's Italian, that her mother makes a dish she calls cardoon or gardoon from the flower stalks of burdock. You can see it's pretty, the flower stalk is pretty big at this stage. Uh, the edible part is the pith inside. Well, we teach on several different levels, adults as well as children from all over the community. Also, we're working with teacher training workshops and programs and working with several colleges and universities. The pith itself is very soft and uh, lacks any sort of fibers in it. We're going to try this today. The way we're going to do it today is boil it in a little bit of salted water and add some butter to it. I think the Arboretum has a mission, in a sense, to take what is known, already known about ecology and apply it to practical situations. Carrie signed a contract to serve as the ecological consultant on a 345 kV line in southeastern New York. The job was an interesting one in that a lot of the techniques that the Public Service Commission was about to recommend were tried on that line. Part of our job was to devise an environmental protection plan of how do you construct something without causing a lot of damage environmentally. Then the second part would be to implement those guidelines by being the on-site advisor. Like this one over there will have to be removed, right? Well, this big the one we will, the little one that you've topped, that's, that's just right. We've got a lot of crown left on it, and the tree will probably survive. You try to retain as much vegetation as you possibly can, minimize any erosion, try to blend in the right away with the rest of the vegetation. In other words, try to maintain everything as natural as possible. Don't put anything artificial there except the towers, which have to be there. The other thing that we got involved with was to develop a wildlife management plan and try to devise a series of steps or projects that would benefit wildlife. Of course, part of the wildlife management plan is to protect them as well as any other species. Right. So if you do run into an area where there's a lot of them, I'd like to know about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can see about moving them rather well, than killing them. Right. You'd rather not kill them. Rather than have them removed if there's that many. Well, if the total goal is minimum impact, and killing an animal is an impact on the environment.
the last part was to devise a restoration plan. The surprise of the whole thing was that we later implemented that plan, which we weren't contracted to do initially. What it means to most people is that they don't see the line. They don't notice it. And that's exactly what you're trying to design. Personally, I think the power line work is the most important thing I do. I enjoy that. Because it's a real thing. It's a real problem. You can see some real advances. People begin to, to write to and call to carry our breed and ask for power line advice. And that means someone out there is listening. And that's good. Environmental preservation is important because if we don't preserve the environment, we're committing suicide. It's our function at the Arboretum to spread this word by whatever means we can. The uh, Rio Samala and the Rio Nawalati will be diverted into a tunnel. Which is the uh, project in Guatemala was the assessment of the national 25-year energy plan. Lake Atitlan had two projects at the beginning, and the one that we are considering is the one called Chusibel. I see. And where will the outfall be? Well, it will come out to this end of the lake. The aim of an environmental so assessment uh, is to make the development project compatible with uh, environmental preservation. We uh, examine the development project, find out what the engineers have in mind, then look at the site and try and predict what could go wrong in the environmental scene. The Chinautla River, which is the main sewer of Guatemala City, was draining straight into one of the hydro projects without any treatment at all. This could easily be avoided now that it's been identified. Most people think that development is diametrically opposed to environmental conservation. We don't share this view. We feel that with judicious planning, development can be made entirely compatible with environmental conservation. With water development schemes, often organisms hazardous to man proliferate. Disease vectors like snails can have a population explosion and spread to waterborne diseases like malaria or schistosomiasis. So if we find that uh, a reservoir is going to be created in a certain place, we want to know if the snail is there already so we can avoid the disease. We had um, 15 or so different energy sources to evaluate from an environmental standpoint and Lake Atitlan was one of the hydro sites. Well, the importance of Lake Atitlan is that a lot of people, particularly Indians, depend on it for their very livelihood. It is generally agreed that it's one of the most beautiful places left on this earth. And as time goes on, beauty is going to get rarer and rarer. Certainly biologically unique. And once these organisms have made extinct, that's the end of millennia of evolutionary history.
We needed a building at the Arboretum that would house our facilities, and we very much wanted it to reflect our ethic of environmental responsibility. It was important to us that everyone who worked on the building share that vision. The Arboretum wanted an architect who would give them a building that would not be plunked down on the land, destroying it, but rather would be a part of the land, so that it would say what the Arboretum is all about. It is not set on the site, it's set deeply down into the ground with just the roof sticking out, so that it will be in many ways an earth building. This building is really a very crude attempt to do what any wildflower or weed or blade of grass does all the time, and that is use solar energy directly. It's the sign of the Arboretum, it's our label, it's our badge. It's the contact that we're going to have with the greatest number of people, and therefore it's got to represent us just as perfectly and, and, and appropriately as possible. And that's why this building is so very important to us.